I come to bear witness that there is no other God but Jehovah, and that Jesus Christ is his only son, a prophet, and savior of the world. That there is no other name whereby men shall be saved, but by and through the name of Jesus Christ. And at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ, the only son of the most sovereign, omnipotent God, is Lord. Grace and mercy to the world and to my kingdom, brothers and sisters, peace be unto you and God be glorified. As we continue in this matter, this series is entitled The Pleasure Factor. Uh, the first one of this series was Lovers of Pleasure More Than Lovers of God. There are people that are seeking pleasure before God and we said in that particular, in that particular sermon is that are you allowing your pleasure to hijack your relationship with God? The second of this series, The Pleasure Factor, is lovers of possession and physical pleasure. Are you so tuned in to yourself where all you want to do is feel good? You're not really caring about nothing else or nobody else. It's really all about you. You, you, you. Receiving physical pleasure and possession. What can I get? How much can I get? And how I'm going to stop people from taking what I've gotten? Pleasure. Well, the third of this series is uh, we can find it in the book of Revelation. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Revelation. We'll be reading chapter 3. And we will uh, read verses 14 through 22. I think it's necessary to read all of the verses. Therefore, you can get a greater understanding here of what Christ is saying as he spoke through John on the Isle of Patmos. I find it uh, interesting how he chose to use the words that he used. And that's Revelation chapter 3. Remember, it's it's the revelation, there's no S on it, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And Jesus is giving John on the Isle of Patmos a sneak peek into what he is doing. So Revelation chapter 3, and we'll start at uh, verse 14 as the message is given. It says, he's talking here to the church of Laodicea. And, and unto the angels of the church of Laodicea. These things said the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou were cold or hot, so then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, increase with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest thou not thou art wretched and miserable, and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou may be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anointed thine eyes with eyesalve that thou mayest see. And many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, 
I will come in to him and he will sup with him and be with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And what I'm going to use for a text this morning in this series, the pleasure factor, the third of the series, which is the lukewarm church, pleasure-driven while having fun. The lukewarm church, pleasure-driven while having fun. It is interesting that the writer here decided to address seven churches. And in his address, he addressed the church of Ephesus, the church of Smyrna, the church of Pergamos, the church of Thyatira, the church of Sardis, the church of Philadelphia, as well as he addressed the church of Laodicea. You see, one thing that all of these churches had in common that kind of leaps out to you is that they all had in common uh, what Jesus was telling unto them. He said, I know thy works. You see, God knows our works. He knows what each church is doing. Also understand that these churches was planted in Asia. And the writer is telling them, I know who you are. I know your works. Now note that he was talking to each one of these churches individually. But he was giving a prognosis, if you please, of how the church was doing collectively. And some say that uh, this is a gigantic type of um, cognitive development within the church itself as far as the maturity level. And that as the church becomes more mature, it then begins to move like the church in Philadelphia. So we see here that it is important that we understand that the writer here is giving us a sneak peek into what the instruction was concerning the church. The lukewarm church in Laodicea, pleasure driven while having fun. In other words, they really didn't take God seriously. This is a church that seeks to please the world rather than to please God. How many of you know that we are already there? where people are more interested in what people say about their church or the church as a whole, they're not really concerned about what God says. And what we have many times is people attending church to be able to get what they want, not to give to God what he wants. And that's his praise and his worship and his being obedient to him. The scripture tells us that obedience is far more better than sacrifice. And we have to ask ourselves the question, are we the church of Laodicea? And when I say that, I'm speaking as a whole, the body of Christ, the kingdom of God, those that are in the house of God, those that represent Christ, those that are kingdom citizens that are trying to live a life for Christ. Are we the body of Christ, the church of Laodicea? Let's look and see exactly what this church has and what this church have done over, over the years and during that time when the writer was writing. It says here in verse 16 in Revelation 3, uh, let's pick it up at verse 15. It says, I know thy work that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou were cold or hot. You see, God does not want you being wishy-washy. He does not want you being lukewarm. He want to know who you with. 
See, if you're with God, then there are certain things, there are certain characteristics, certain types of behaviors that goes along with you being with God. If you're not with God, then your characteristics, your behavior, the way you live your life is an indication that you're not with him. So it's no such thing as judging somebody. If you see him eating an apple and you say, why are you eating that apple? That doesn't mean that you're judging him. You're just basically giving an observation, an observation of truth. So God sees us based on not so much what we say. He observes us for by the matter of what we do. What are you doing if you say you're a Christian? You cannot have it both ways. You can't say, I'm a Christian today, but I'm going to be in the world this afternoon. You got to make it up in your mind and know for yourself that he would rather. Now, this is what Jesus is saying. I would rather that you are cold or hot. He said, for if you are lukewarm, I'm going to spit or spew you out of my mouth. That means that I don't want to have nothing to do with you. Will the church say amen? amen. Then he goes on and says, verse 16, so then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth because thou say it. This is what the church is saying. Thou say it. Maybe it's you because you are the church. You are the body of Christ. So do you want it both ways? Because thou say it, I am rich and increase with goods. In other words, I got some money and I got some things. And the church today has already rendered herself to uh, being super rich and I got some money and I got some things and I want to look good and I want to drive good, live good, and I want to do all of these things. I got some money and I got some things. Can somebody say some things? I'm increased with goods and have need of nothing. Ah, uh, now when you step off into that pool of water, you're telling God that he himself is not necessary. I have need of nothing. Isn't it amazing that when you finally get a few things and you're doing good and you got the house you always wanted, you got the money you always wanted, the tendency is that God becomes on the back burner. God just becomes lesser rather than greater in your mind. Why? Because you don't have to pray to get your lights back on. You don't have to pray, oh God, please give me enough money to get my car fixed. You don't have to pray, oh God, you know, I, I want this and I want that, because all you have to do is go out and buy this or buy that. Or you just got it made, you're feeling good. And the tendency is when we finally get all we want, finally live in the mansion that we always wanted, then the tendency is that we put God on the second or third, maybe fourth or fifth burner. He's really not that important now. And this is why sometimes you... You can hear about people that are weighing maybe uh, 160 pounds, uh, buffed up, cut up, all in shape, look good, feel good. And while at the gym, they drop dead because they've gotten so uh, proud and arrogant about how their physique look. Are you worshiping <laughs> yourself? Are you the church that you worship in? Because what we have many times, we have people that uh, are so caught up into themselves until they put God second and third and fourth, and, and all of a sudden, things happen. Well, this is what the church of Laodicea was doing. They said, we don't need anything. We, we good, need of nothing. And the response to this was, and knowest thou not, that's verse 17 of Revelation chapter 3, and know it thou not that thou art, what? Wretched. Help us, Holy Ghost. And miserable. And poor. And blind. And naked. Now let me help you understand uh, what the writer is saying. He said, yeah, you got a little cocky and got a little swag about you because you finally got something. Maybe you won the lottery or maybe you, maybe you got a lot of money to come into you. You say, well, I don't need God no more. You know, I don't have to go to church. 
And we have people out there today that are saying that they don't have to go to church anymore because uh, they can have house church. Well, we started out, you know, most churches start out in the house or at a hotel, but that's not God superintendent. But if you want to worship in the house and all that, don't use that as a way of not saying, I don't want to come to to assemble myself together with other believers that be more than that can fit in your house. Will the church say amen? So we have to come to understand that Hebrews tells us this. Hebrews, I believe, chapter 10, it tells us this. I believe it's verse 25. It says, and forsake not assembling yourselves together as the manner of some. So he's letting you know there's no surprises. Some people just don't want to come to church. But exalting one another. See, you come to church to encourage your brother and your sister. Exalting one another, and also you're encouraging one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. So we come together to church so we can encourage each other to keep moving. Yeah, you got hit with sickness, but keep it moving. Yeah, things hurt your heart, but keep moving. Maybe you got hurt by a brother or sister in the church, but don't stop now. Keep moving. Go that extra lap. Go that extra mile. Just, just keep moving. Why? Because when you're in church, you can be encouraged by your brother and your sister. But the enemy wants to isolate you, to eliminate you. And as long as he can get you whining like a hound dog on a nail, you won't move. You just sit back and start throwing darts at the church. These people ain't no good, and I don't know why they, they keep treating me this way. Here's what I understood. I understood a long time ago that when I went to church, I brought church. Y'all don't hear what I'm telling you. When I went to church, I brought the church. Why? Because I am the church. I am the temple that the Holy Spirit lived in. The scripture tells us that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. So when you go to church, you bring the church. Now, if your own personal church is jacked up, why are you mad at everybody else? Because you're the one that brought the poison in. You wonder why you can't breathe. That's because you the one brought in all of the poison. You the church, and when you bring in bad things to the church, then you need to allow people to help you extract the mess that is in you by encouraging you, by building you up. But it is the enemy that has done this. Can everybody say the enemy? The enemy don't want you to be happy in any church you go to. How many of you know where you go, there you are? You go to a church and you say, well, they ain't treating me right. That's maybe because you have low self-esteem. Maybe you love cookies rather than the word. Maybe you love people to pat you on the back of the head and tell you how great things are going to be. But when you, when you became born again, you became born into an army of soldiers. Ain't nobody got time to keep putting a pacifier in your mouth. But see, the body of Christ have become, in many cases, weak. And as a result, you know, we think we're strong, but as the word of God tells us, sometimes we're just miserable. And we look at these words in verse 17, it says here, it says, you are wretched. The word wretched means miserable, sorry, a miserable life. That's what wretched means, a person who is ill and don't know it. Have you been sick and didn't know it? Now, this is what the writer is saying. You can read it for yourself. Verse 17, it says, because thou say, I am rich and increase in goods. Okay. Then he goes on down and talks about not knowing that thou art what? Wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. See, sometimes you can think you got it going on. Not knowing that you're already falling down. Not knowing that you're already on the ground, you just, haven't, you just don't know it yet. So a person that is wretched, as I said, is miserable, sorry, sorry, uh, miserable life, a person who, who is ill and don't know he's ill. The word miserable means unhappy, sad, sorrowful, dejected, depressed, downcast, despondent. 
gloom and doom. Don't know it. You, you, you're trying to act like you're happy, but on the inside, you know something is wrong. The word poor means to be destitute, deprived, beggarly, poverty. It also means without. There's some things you just don't have, so without. Not knowing you are poor. A mindset of poverty. So he is telling the church, you say you're rich, but you're really poor. How people think that when they get all the stuff they want, they say, I am now rich. Are you? You know, the word says uh, the man was running around saying how much he got. His barns all fill up. And, and the word of God tells us, I believe what Jesus just said, that thy soul shall be required of thee this night. What shall it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his own soul? Write this down. Uh, you cannot pay your way to heaven. I don't care how much money you got. Heaven is not for sale. And you cannot buy your way out of hell. I don't care how much money you got. You can't pay your way out of hell. And you will be going to one or the other. You're going to go one, one or the other place, and, and it's pretty simple. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and believe that God had raised him up from the dead, you are now saved. And if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and you do not believe that God has raised him from the dead, you are lost. Now, if you are saved, you're going to heaven. The scripture tells us to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. There's no ambiguity there. There's no reasoning with that. You can't de negotiate your way out of that. It is what it is. And if you do not accept Yeshua Messiah as your personal savior, you will be lost. And for people that are lost, they are going to hell. That's it. Your mama can't come and talk to the devil and say, okay, devil, uh, you know, don't let him go to hell. And the devil said, you didn't read the war manual. I don't take hostages. You didn't read the war manual. I, I don't negotiate. You should have accepted Jesus. I'm in hell for eternity, so I'm trying to get as many people as I can to join me. That's what the devil is saying. He said, I don't care what, what they look like. I am an equal opportunity destroyer. And I'm doing everything. This is what the devil is saying. I'm doing everything in my power to get them so confused about God is because I know I messed up and I want everybody else to come join me in hell. That's what he's saying. But we make it deep, we make it spooky. It's really just that simple. You either going to heaven or going to hell. So he goes on and he say that thou art poor. Then he said, thou art blind. The word blind means unable to see. It also means diseased. It's having eyes but cannot see. Have you ever seen someone with eyeballs, beautiful eyeballs, but their eyes are shifting, but they can't see? Now that's a spiritual condition, having eyes but cannot see. And we have many people that got eyes, but they can't see what God wants them to do. They're blind. And this is what the writer is telling the church of Laodicea. You got eyes, but you can't see. You have diseased eyes and you are lacking perception. You have no discernment. You are just walking, but you don't know where you're going. Then he goes on and said that this church is naked. To be naked means to be undressed. It means to have barrenness. It means no clothes. 
To be naked also means to be open. People can see you for who you really are. So the writer here is telling the church of Laodicea, I know thy works. That's why it's much better for us as believers just go ahead on and confess it. He told seven churches, I know your works. He didn't say, I'm guessing about your work. He said, I'm not sure about your work. He said, I know your works. What would happen when we just come and admit to ourselves, I am not what I say I am? I got some real issues. I got some anger problems. I get mad at times. I throw a temper tantrum sometimes, and, and I'm just going to, you know, what if you just said, you know what, I'm going to let y'all in on some area now and then I need a bottle and a pacifier. Because <laughs> sometimes I need somebody to hold me. I need somebody to tell me everything going to be all right. How many know that everything is not always going to be all right? But see, God knows it. That's why he said if you confess your faults, if you confess your sins before him, if you let him know that you know he know, then he said he is faithful and just to forgive you of all of your sins and to cleanse you from all of your unrighteousness. The purpose of confession is to let God know that you know he already know the mess that you're in. Will the church say amen? But people won't do that. They, you know, they like to try to pretend. So as we move on, you see this church that he's talking about, the church of Laodicea, does, does not, this just didn't happen overnight. I want you to know that this church didn't just come this way overnight. The church does not become lukewarm overnight. It, the church uh, drifts that way. It happens over time. It's through a process of gradualism. You see, you don't fall into sin overnight. You gradually start to tolerate it. And that's what the world wants the church to do today. The world wants the church to tolerate transsexuals. The world wants the church to tolerate homosexuals. And the, the reason why they want you to tolerate it is because the more you tolerate it, the more you begin to accept it. And the more you begin to accept it, the more you see it as a love thing rather than a sin thing. See, the enemy knows how to psychosocially or spiritually brainwash you and to accept something that he knows is wrong. And most people know it's wrong, but they're so emotionally shattered that they're afraid to speak up about right or wrong. They want everybody to like them. They want everybody to go along with them. They, you know, they say, well, I, I got some friends and some of my best friends are transsexuals and homosexuals and bisexual, trisexuals and all of these other sexual things. And, and girl, I just love them. I just love them. I mean, all that's fine if you just love them, but have you ever told them the truth? See, when you accept something, then the tendency is to muzzle your mouth. Because the first thing the enemy is going to say, if you love me, well, why you just can't accept me the way I am? And the answer to that is because that's not the way you are. When God looks at it, it's, it's, it's amazing how God uh, had already foresaw it through his providential will and through the providential schedule. He already saw we was going to be here. To tell you about the wisdom of God, God is so smart that, that God had already saw that we were going to be reaching for bright, pretty, shiny things. God says that I'm going to put something in them that even when they do cosmetic work on themselves, there's going to be something in them that they, can, they cannot take away my signature for every man that's on the planet and woman. He said, you're not going to erase my signature off you. He said, you may be able to cover up Yah. Everybody remember Yah? Where well, you got the Y that comes from your eyes to your nose. Your nose become the A and your mouth become the H. He said, you can cover that up with a mask. He said, you can begin to move things around physically. You can get it cut and tucked. He said, you can do all that. You can change things biologically. 
But he said, I have an assignment in you that tells me who you are. And even if you try to change that, it will mutate greater of who you are. And that is your DNA. He said, after you get through cutting and tucking and changing your makeup and putting on rouge and lipstick and eyeliner, rocking around here with skirts and dresses, not knowing who you really are. He said, there's one thing that I put in your body that will never change. And that's your DNA. He said, when they have your funeral, they may say, Miss Jones. But he said, I'm going to know you as Eddie, Mr. Eddie Jones. Somebody say amen. They can change all of the stuff around you, but he said, your DNA will never change. You can make your hands smaller, give yourself all other stuff you want. You can augment this and augment that. But when you get buried and they do your DNA, you are a man that was call yourself being transferred into a woman. Or you are a woman that calls yourself being transferred into a man. But when God see you, when he see you spiritually, he see male and female. Will the church say amen? Now even what I'm saying now, uh, there will be people that would probably say something about it. And that's okay. But I'm still right. You may not like it. You may not agree with it. You may feel, well, why you got to say it like that? Because it needs to be told exactly the way God has given me to tell it. This is why the church is weak. Everybody coming in now. Everybody want Jesus, but they want Jesus their way. Let's look and see how the church became this, this weak thing that she is today. And as the church of Laodicea. You see... Each church is a reflection of the leadership of the church. So whatever church you're in, you, you're reflecting the leadership. And you attract who you are. And occasionally, strong pastors will attract weak people so they can be strong like the pastor. But normally, you attract who you are. If you are a man, if your mindset is lukewarm, you're going to attract lukewarm people. If you have a warrior's mentality, you see warriors come around you, and at times you have weak people coming around you because they want to be strong. If you are on the down low as a pastor, be it male or female, why are you all shocked that down low people in your church? If you are afraid to tell people the truth, you're going to be around people that are afraid to tell you the truth. You see, you attract who you are. If you are a passive leader, you will attract people that are passive, afraid to speak up, and again, some of the weak ones will come around so they can try to gain strength through you. You attract who you are. These attractions are all called spirit of attraction. This is why most churches are weak. And yes, that's what I said. They're weak. They're feeble need. They're afraid to speak truth to power. They're afraid that people are going to leave. They're afraid that when they leave, they're going to take their tithes and their offerings. They're afraid there won't be money to pay the bills. Afraid they become weak, so therefore they preach cotton candy sermons. Very sweet and full of air. But when you bite into it, there's nothing there. They are weak. They become to the point where they want to please everybody. And when they find themselves not pleasing everybody, they get mad at themselves because the people would tell them, we're tired of hearing this stuff. Why can't you preach on something else, Pastor? Therefore, the deacon board and whatever other board will start to give pastors script. We want you to preach on this. Well, the Lord told me to preach this. No, we don't. We, we, the people in the church are tired of hearing about stuff like that. Weak pastors. 
spaghetti back pastors just wiggling all over the place. I'd rather have a few and have them to be strong than to have many and have them to be weak. So the point is, is that the church has become weak because of the leadership. No spine, no grizzle, just weak. Afraid that people won't like them. Mad when people don't like them. Weak leadership will always produce weak leaders. How are you going to get strength out of a weak leader? And these are those that come to church for pleasure. They get mad when you don't pat them on the head and tell them how good of a job they're doing. They want you to, you know, uh, praise them and make them feel good. They don't want you to tell them the truth like you need to straighten up and fly right. Weak. So weak pastors produce weak members. Weak members produce weak families. Weak families produce weak societies. And weak societies produce weak schools. And weak everything. And before you know it, we're living in a weak society. You can't take nothing, haven't been through nothing, don't want to go through nothing. And whenever something bad happens to you, you think the world is coming to an end. That's weakness. But God did not give us that. He told us to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And the only way we get power is that we must have leadership that can stand up in the power of God and preach the truth without worrying about what people think. Will the church say amen? amen. Go to 1 John chapter 3, chapter 2, please. 1 John chapter 2. You want to know why? We're in this weakness, this feeble needness. Everybody weak. First John chapter 2, it's a familiar verse. You should, you should really have that memorized. I memorized that one when I was in high school. I wanted to make sure I was taking that to mean to college because I wanted to make sure that I was learning something. And that is uh, 1 John 2 verse 15. It says, love not the world love not the world and what does that mean it means don't love the world what does that mean the world is a mindset are you acting like the world thinking like the world it says love not the world then it goes on and says neither the things that are in the world if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And you can read it this way. If any man love the world mindset, the love of the Father is not in him. You can't have it both ways. You can't say I'm going to the club and come to the church. You can't be drinking, smoking, and, and cussing folks out and, and stealing and robbing and saying I'm a good Christian. You can't go where the world goes. You can't dress like the world dress. You can't do what the world does. You can't be like the world. You can't act like the world. You shouldn't be in the same place of the world. You can't go to a strip joint talking that you're going in there to save the women. Love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. There's an S on that. Neither the things that are in the world. Now... John is giving you a clarification. He says, verse 16, for all that is in the world. He's telling you what's in the world. Will the church say amen? He's telling you what is in the world. He said, all that is in the world. The first one listed, the lust of the flesh. You see, the flesh, all it wants to do is to please itself through sinful activities. That's your flesh. It wants to please itself through sinful activities. So if you're wondering why you can't stop something, that's because the flesh wants to please itself through sinful activities. Be it drugs, alcohol, be it sexual addiction, be whatever it is, all the flesh want to do is to please itself through sinful activities. Then the writer goes on and says, the lust of the eyes. 
That is to want what you see. Your eyes can ruin your life by what you see. Your eyes can link you to covetousness. Your eyes can link you to idolatry. Your eyes can link you to a lot of things where you'll be desiring something that you know you do not need. You see, when I go to Walgreens from time to time, I have to make sure my eyes are not looking at Chunky Monkey. I have to turn my head because if my eyes see the monkey, my tendency is to be drawn to it. The scripture says you're not tempted uh, except for your lusts and your intents and your desire that you are drawn to what you see. That's why they don't put the monkey in the box and cover him up. Because most of the time, if you don't see it, you don't want it. How many here what God's telling you? That's why they have all of your sweet stuff right at the counter because they know it's going to take you a long time to get your purse out and, or to get your wallet out. And by the time you're looking at all this your other stuff, you're seeing everything on the counter. That's called impulse buying based on your eyes, what your eyes see. Do you have things right now that wasn't on your mind until you saw it? Holla back, church. You went in the store to get one thing, but you saw another thing. And the thing you went to get was not the thing you brought home. It was the thing that you saw. Can somebody clap back and let me know that you're in the house with me? You went to get a spoon, but by the time you saw the set of spoons, you saw some cakes over there. You ended up walking out of there with four cakes and left the spoon and the knife in the store. So your temptation comes through your flesh and it comes through your eyes. What are you looking at? Then he went on and said, in the pride of life, these are things that you want. See, the church of Laodicea was so caught up in things. They, they had eye issues. They had flesh issues. They had pride of life issues. They wanted more and more and more and more. And how many of you know that the more you want, the more you want? And even when you get what you want, you still want more. And that is the pride of life. So the church of Laodicea was suffering through these things. But God tells us to love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. He said also in verse 16, for all that's in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. It is not of the Father, but it is of the world. Verse 17 says, and the world passes away. The world is going to leave you, or you're going to leave the world. And the lust thereof, but he that doeth. Can everybody say, I got to do something? Now, we know we're not in the Old Testament, but to show God you loving, faith is doing. So if I'm doing something, I am showing faith. I can't say I love you and I'm not doing anything. You can't say you're a Christian and you never come to church. Well, you can say it, but you're lying to yourself. So he that doeth the will of God abided forever. I want you to understand, church, that we don't want to be the church of Laodicea. We don't want to be a lukewarm church. And right now, I, I, I want you to uh, put your hand on your forehead and anoint yourself. Put your hand on your forehead and just tell yourself, say, I will not be the church of Laodicea. I will not be a lukewarm church. My body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. I am the church that I bring. I am the church that I bring. And I will not be a lukewarm church. I will be a church that will stand for truth. I will be a church that will stand for righteousness. That will stand for love, for joy, for peace. I am the church that I attend. I will not be. A lukewarm church. Hallelujah. You have to know that you bring the church with you. 
You know, some people say, well, I'm coming to church, other church is dead, and you know why the church is so dead? That's because you brought a dead church. You came in dead, and you wonder why you see corpse. But if you come in alive, even if you see corpse, you may revive someone else. Will the church say amen? I want you to get this now. It's important. Church is a place where we come to get to know God. The other thing I want you to understand is God is revealing. The church has never been a place of pleasure and fun. We got it wrong. Most churches have it wrong. You're training your children to come to church for fun. So now they're coming to church for fun and acting a fool at school. When years ago they would come to church and that's how they learned how to act was at church. They learned how to sit down and be quiet at church. They learned how to recognize when the preacher or the Sunday school teacher is teaching, they need to be quiet. They shouldn't be talking while the word is going forth. They learn how to adjust themselves. They learn how to sit in one place, not jumping up, going to the bathroom all the time. By the time they got to school, the children was already disciplined and knew how to act. But now, the church is a place where they come to have fun. They don't come to really hear from God. They come to have fun and and meet people and just have a good time. The church is not a place to have fun. Write this down. Write down the church is a serious place. I was recently at a funeral and it, it hits hard when you're at a funeral and you see someone that you love and someone that you knew laying in a casket in a church. Now, none of us know when we leave in here, but we all going. And you got to be ready to go. And no such thing getting ready. You better be ready. Because if you're ready and you, you take the church as a serious place, if you want to clown and act a fool, you can do that at home. You can do that at school. You can do that anywhere else you want to do. But the church has to be a place where you come to receive the word and receive the joy of God and express your joy and express your love for God and your love for one another that when you leave out of the church, you should feel displaced in some kind of way. You should say that I, I, I want to be where God is at. I want to be where God is at because Wherever God is at is where I want to be, and it's a serious place. You know, we, we don't get to have church as a fun spot. Why? Because eternity is at stake. Remember I told you there's a place called heaven and a place called hell. Eternity is at stake. So the church has never been a place of pleasure and fun the church is a serious place, not a fun spot. It is about eternity, heaven, or hell. But there's something else we need to know as believers. We must never get joy confused with pleasure and fun. I think the tendency is that the church uh, have dumbed down her spirituality and dumbed down her relationship with God in order to please people that, well, it seems bored and why are we having fun? The church has never been that place where you come and have fun. It has never been that place where you get hooked on tricks and skimmicks and gimmicks and things. It's not the church. You know, if you want to have fun, go to a circus or go to the magic kingdom. But the church must be a place in your life where you can come and be all you need to be and express yourself to God and let God begin to heal you from the inside out. We got to have a refuge, a place of refuge where we come to worship God and expose ourselves to God for who we really are. And when we do that, then we're telling God that He's worthy of all the praise. In the book of Nehemiah, chapter 8, verse 10, it says, For the joy of the Lord is your strength. You see, 
You don't need pleasure and fun when you have joy. How many of you have just got happy out by yourself one time? Maybe your check didn't come in or your car broke down and you found yourself that you didn't have as much money as you thought you had in your bank account and you got all frustrated, but somewhere on the inside, God says, I got to I gotta hit him with some joy right now. And then you start looking back and thinking, well, uh, I remember God did this for me. I, I remember that, you know, I got that, and I remember this, and I remember that. And all of a sudden, you get happy in the midst of your, of your, of your pain and your trial. How many has ever been there? How many has ever had that to happen? You just get happy all by yourself. And you find yourself dancing. You find yourself shouting. Fact about it, I, I, I got so caught up one time, I was walking the track over there in Shallow and just started hollering while I was walking. Lord, I, I mean, just, 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 I, I don't know where it came from. I couldn't explain it. I, I, I just couldn't do it. And all of a sudden, I just started saying, thank you, Jesus, and just hollering and praising God and, and just acting a fool all in broad daylight. How many of you know that joy will bring you through some stuff that nothing else can bring you through? Oh. It seems like when clouds of anxieties are pouring down over your mental skies and depression and oppression and suppression begins to knock on your toe, God says, I can't have that for my son Joy. Joy just comes from nowhere. See, he know when you he know what you need when you need it. Holla back, clap back. See, he know what you need when you need it. Can somebody say amen? He know what you need when you need it. And he said, I, I ain't got time to send a preacher to him. Man. I ain't got time to send his mama to him. I don't have no time to be able to get somebody to go to him. So God says, joy, give it to him. And you start praising God, uh, realizing that all I need is God. Holler back, holler back. All I need is God. And if I got God with the joy of the Lord is my strength, there is nothing that I cannot withstand. You got to understand God got you. Look to your name and say, God got me. What do you do when you come to church and you come to church and, and they got lights, camera action, they got all this stuff going on, but you're miserable? You just got diagnosed with stage four breast cancer. But the pastor too busy to talk to you because he got to put on the church production. And you're miserable. The officers don't want to receive you as you walk in. They don't take down your information. You put your name on the prayer list. You tell them what it is, but they never make it to the prayer team. Lord, help us up in here. It don't make it to the prayer team. And when the prayer team do get it, uh, you've already had the operation. Doctors have already been giving you radiation and they finally got your note. And these are the same people saying, now you know we love you. You need to learn early. But you got to learn to stand by yourself. It's a beautiful thing if you got people that can help you, but the scripture says, let every man work out his own salvation. And he goes on to say, with fear and trembling. What do you do when there's no one to pray for you? What do you do when there's no one to call you? What do you do when everybody that say they love you are never present? And you're going through pure hell. That's why we cannot have weak people in the church. Everybody must be a soldier. Everybody must be booted and suited and ready to go and do the kingdom work. Everybody got to know God for themselves. Everybody got to know how to pray. Everybody got to know how to fast. 
Everybody got to know how to find a scripture in the Bible that can uplift you out of the mara that you may be going through. Everybody got to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. You got to know God for yourself. Will the church say amen? amen. Have you been through some things? If you've been through some things and you've been by yourself while going through and wave at me. And if you haven't been through some things, you will and you will be by yourself. And you better know how to pray. You better know how to talk to God. You better not be like the lukewarm church, pleasure-driven and having fun. Yeah, I go to church. We have fun over our church. Girl, they got all kind of stuff over there. We can do whatever we want to do. But what happens when you're by yourself and them suicidal demons start talking to you? How many know they're going to show up? <laughs> they're going to show up and start whispering. You see, ain't nobody call you yet. You ain't got no hit on Facebook, girl. They don't really love you. They always talking about they love people, but they don't love, they don't even know you're in the hospital. And then the demon will say this here, now how long have you been in the hospital? And then you're thinking, well, I've been in here for about 30 days now. And ain't nobody called. You better, you better connect with Jesus. You better know God for yourself. Because when you know him for yourself, church becomes different. And that's why the world don't want to come to church, because they say, why should I come to the church when you're acting worse than what we do on the street? Let me give you something to, to pull from. You see... We don't have to become like the world to win the world. We don't have to become like the world to win the world. Now, there's a group of females out there right now, and they're dressing up as prostitutes, walking the block, going to talk to pimps, so they can be able to find out who the prostitutes are that they can go over to him and witness to him. Now we know that a John don't know the difference between sets of prostitutes. They don't know if the girl's saved or not, but they do know what she wear is an indication of who she is. So one of these young ladies got a little frustrated that a John pulled up and said, how much does it cost? Oh, no, I'm just dressed up in this here. We, we out here evangelism. Well, now you got the devil confused. Holler back. <laughs> so you don't have to become the world to witness to the world. We must be different. And people should know the difference. You must be different. You must dress different, talk different, act different. Uh, carry yourself differently. My wife and I was looking, I believe it was here, my wife and I looking out the window of the church and we saw a young lady walk by and I said, well, uh, today you wouldn't even know if she's a church girl or she's in the world. You would not know the difference because all of that is in the church now. Why? Because we leadership would tolerate anything because don't worry about, don't want to hurt people's feelings. And our young ladies need to know early. I say even as far as six and seven, they need to know early. This is not what you wear at a church. But we worrying about their feelings. Well, you're gonna hurt her feeling. I don't really care. She gonna she'll thank me for it later. So what we end up doing is letting stuff go. And then when she gets 16, 17 years old, now you mad because a 45 or 50-year-old man looking at your 16-year-old daughter and you calling him the pervert. Well, she's dressed like a woman, but looking, but is a girl. Remember, we talked about that eye thing, didn't we? The desires of the eyes, what you see that looks like a woman, you won't. But we bypass all that because... 
We don't want to hurt our little daughter's feelings. Not knowing that you're protecting them from men that would prey on young girls. Will the church say amen? That's in the church now. It's not just in the world. It's all over the church. People need to know what the church stands for. The church should never become a nightclub. Hear me, church. I've been to a few now where they just look like nightclubs. You walk in, you don't know the difference. They got lights. And some of them even have bars where they have a little hit of wine you can get from time to time. Some pastors drinking and deacons drinking. They sit around the bar. Well, we're trying to win people. Are you? The church should never be a nightclub. And nowhere in the Bible will you find that. You can't find in the Bible where Jesus was at a temple and the lights was off and they got stuff all on the place. But people would do that to compromise with the world and therefore turning people back out into alcoholism. See, what pastors don't understand or understand but just don't want to admit, when you make a scene of a nightclub in church, you're causing some people to relapse. You're causing some people that used to go to clubs all the time, when they see lights and see a little bar, even if it ain't alcohol, they see something look like a bar, you are taking them back to where they're going. It's a trigger for an alcoholic. It's a trigger for a clubber, someone that's going to clubs all the time. They left the club not to come to the club. They left the club to come to church. But nowadays, when they leave the club, they come to church, it's like, well, why should I leave the club? But that's where we're at. We're at a place now where people want to please everybody so they make the church the club scene. Worshiping God should never be a nightclub scene or an environment. People no longer want the word of God. They want to be entertained. So if you don't have a great entertainment center where you got cameras and you got TV screens and you got somebody up entertaining, did you not know by the time the word get up, people don't want to hear it? It's amazing that when you go through all that, when the preacher get up to preach, they sleepy. They tired. In some churches, the worship can go for 30 minutes, but they want the preacher done in 10 and the reason why that is, is because people are prone to entertainment. The church should never be that. People don't grow when they're entertained. People in the church today have been trained to watch church and not to participate in church. And if you're going to watch church, you can watch it on TV. They've been trained to watch church and not to participate in church. And as a result, coming to church is boring. Especially when it comes to the word. Are you sitting in the pews watching church? I want you to know, church, you, we have a call and response here, so you're participating. We have you to stand up. We have you to move around and and participate in what you say you love, and that's God. And as I close, people today are being fed the experience of entertainment of church. You got to get this. They're being fed the experience of entertainment in church, but do not want the real relationship with God in the church. They want the experience. They want to be able to go somewhere and get an experience and feel good, but really don't want God. The world is now influence, influencing the church rather than the church influencing the world. We got the whole thing backwards. The church leaders are now doing what the world says rather than the world are doing what the church leader says. And as a result, the church is losing its influence in the world, losing its power base, losing the young people. 
The young people are sick and tired of coming and seeing lights, camera, action. I think the leadership have gotten it wrong. The leadership have gotten it wrong because the young people want what their grandfathers had, their grandmothers had. They don't want this mess that they're seeing today. They want real relationship with God. And in many cases, the, the elders have gotten it wrong because they're trying to appease the young people. And the young people are saying, no, I want the real. I want something real in my life. And many of them are leaving the church because they know it's fake. They know they hurt too. They know they have fear too. You don't have to become a drug dealer to win drug dealers. And you don't have to become a prostitute to win one. The church of Laodicea has done herself down. And she is now trying to find pleasure and fun in the church. And when she don't find it, she get mad. She get frustrated because she want everyone to be like her. So what's really going on in the church today? The church has left out God. The church has become a social network. Everything is done electronically. No more lock, knocking on doors, uh, no more face-to-face -face witnessing. Many church people say they uh, have passion for Jesus, but do not have compassion for people. The church has become a morning production, bright, pretty, shiny thing. When people are hurting, they could care less about how big a church is or how many people that are there. All they want to know is the God that they serve, the God that they worship is there for them to help them in their time of need. So the question would be, as I wrap this up, the church today is performing like Laodicea. She claims she's rich, but she is poor. She is wallowing in the mara of her own doing. And this is primarily done by weak leaders that are allowing the gradualness of sin to come at her door. And rather than repelling that sin out due to low self-esteem and the desire to be liked, her allowability is allowing everything to flood in. Therefore, we have weak people and weak churches led by weak pastors and weak ministers. And Jesus said it this way. When the blind lead the blind, they both shall fall in the ditch. So let us not be the church of Laodicea, a lukewarm church, pleasure driven while having fun. If you can believe it and receive it, stand to your feet and give God a hand praise in the house of God. Hallelujah. Is there one this morning that after hearing the word of God, maybe you're not saved, the Bible.